So what does NiceCK suggest about offering lipid modification then? So the certain conditions where NiceCK said suggests that we should be offering statin therapy. If you're under 85 and have a 10% 10-year cardiovascular risk, if you're a type 1 diabetic patient in three situations, or one of three, if you're age over 40, if you've had diabetes for 10 years, or if you've got nephropathy secondary to diabetes, then you'd be offering a statin. Type 2 diabetes is like the normal population. So if you have a 10% 10-year cardiovascular risk, those with CKD, we can offer lipid modification therapy, and those with familial hypercholesterolemia. So remember, these are situations where you would offer lipid modification therapy. There are certain conditions where you might consider offering lipid modification therapy, those aged 85 or above, because just their age in themselves most of them at high risk. Obviously, you've got to balance this up with polypharmacy and other conditions they may have. And all patients with type 1 diabetes. So remember, if you're a type 1 diabetic patient with one of these three things, you should be offered. If you're a type 1 diabetic patient without one of those three things, then you can still consider offering it to them. You have a discussion, pros, cons, etc. So what is the, the drug that NICK suggests for primary prevention? A torvastatin, 20 milligrams once a day. If you get a question that suggests statins are contraindicated, then you shouldn't be prescribing ezetimibe, for example. We should be referring for specialist advice in that situation as per NICKS. Aspirin, remember, is not recommended for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. Scarlet fever then, so caused by streptococcus pyogenes or group A streptococcus. And again, your general presentation features first, so fever, sore throat, headache, nausea, fairly non-specific. But the classic standouts are the classic rash. It's a red, rough, sandpaper-like, often described rash, and it starts on the trunk. So that's your specific rash to scarlet fever. And then, of course, you have your strawberry tongue. You can see here, kind of red, bright tongue with little white spots that you can just about see dotted around here on this image. You can do a throat swab for group A streptococcal infection, but it's not usually needed. It's usually a clinical diagnosis. Uh, Management-wise, first-line treatment, as per 9CKS, phenoxymethyl penicillin or penicillin V, QDS, so four times a day for 10 days. And if someone has penicillin allergy and a question that comes up, then azithromycin for five days is what the guidance suggests. In terms of complications that might be described in questions, other infections may be linked to scarlet fever, so otitis media, sinusitis, mastoiditis, pneumonia, meningitis. Rheumatic fever can be a complication of scarlet fever, and post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis can occur with scarlet fever as well. It is a notifiable condition in the UK, and school exclusion rules are 24 hours after starting antibiotics. Potentially, someone may be able to go back to school. Let's move on to the shoulder then, and we'll start with frozen shoulder. So adhesive capsulitis is the official name. You're getting a lot of stiffness around the shoulder joint, which leads to reduced active and passive shoulder movements. There are two different types. There's primary frozen shoulder that just happens without any reason, and then it can be secondary to other things, for example, associations with diabetes or trauma to the area or a background of cardiovascular disease or a background of rotator cuff problems, for example. So primary or secondary. There are three classic phases that you may see in frozen shoulder in questions. The painful phase, so around two to nine months, followed by the stiffness phase, which can go up to a year in duration. And then finally, the resolution phase, which can be up to 42 months. So you kind of get the pain, then the stiffness, and then the resolution. You might get questions in any of these phases. It's a clinical diagnosis, so you may be ruling out other things, but the diagnosis is a clinical one. And there are various management options as per NICKS, so analgesia with paracetamol being first line. Early physiotherapy, so usually for at least around six weeks in frozen shoulder, you can consider a glenohumeral steroid injection early on uh, once diagnosed. And you'll be looking at referral if there's no benefit at three months or if the diagnosis is uncertain. So you give a bit of time to try and see whether those phases can start to develop. But if there's no benefit at three months, um, then you can think about referring to orthopedics. So if you look at NICKS, then in terms of the management of acne, again, of course, various treatment options depending on the severity. So if you want to get that bit right, but what does it say in terms of mild to moderate acne first line? A 12-week topical course first line, you've got three options that can be used. Number one, adapalene plus benzyl peroxide. Number two, tretinoin plus clindamycin. And number three, benzyl peroxide plus 
clindamycin. So 12 weeks, topical course, two things together initially for mild to moderate acne. If you get a question on moderate to severe acne, then again, it's a 12-week course, but you get a couple of other options. So again, you've got topical adapalene and benzoyl peroxide, the same as up here. Secondly, however, you've got topical adapalene plus benzyl peroxide plus an oral antibiotic at this point, and we'll cover those in a second. And thirdly, as above, a topical tretinoin plus clindamycin. So if you see a question where someone's been described as moderate to severe acne, remember you've got this option here as a first line 12 week course, topical adapalene, benzyl peroxide plus an oral antibiotic. Now, if you look at the guidance, if you're choosing all antibiotics as part of your answer, which one should you be thinking about as per NICKS? Two main options to remember, of course, lymocycline 408 milligrams once a day or doxycycline 100 milligrams once a day. Again, should not be used on their own when it comes to acne. They are part of a combined treatment such as the one above. And the third also recessive scenario is when one parent has two affected genes, i.e. this parent actually has the condition because both of their genes are affected. What are the chances for the next uh, generation? 0% chance the child will have the condition and 100% chance the child will be a carrier. So there's a 0% chance the child will have the condition because you have an, a parent with no affected genes here. So they must get at least one of those genes from this parent. And also recessive means you need two affected genes. So they, 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 they cannot have the condition, but there's a 100% chance that they will be a carrier which will be important for them going forward in terms of looking at their future offspring and because they must get at least one of these affected genes from the parent who's affected and therefore they end up with this 100% uh, this chance of being a carrier and potentially moving that gene down the line. So three situations for autosomal recessive where one parent has an affected gene, where two parents have an affected gene or where one parent has both genes affected. And there is obviously key guidance um, according to NICE as for when we should be referring suspected breast cancer for an urgent referral to have it ruled out. So it's worth going through these guidance in detail. There are three main categories to think about. Those that you should definitely refer within two weeks. Those that you should consider referring within two weeks. And those that you should consider referring as a non-urgent referral to a breast clinic, for example. Let's start with the top ones, the ones that definitely need to be picked up when it comes up in questions. When should you definitely refer within two weeks to rule out breast cancer? If someone's age over 30 with an unexplained breast lump with or without pain, so it's not just painless, but the key number is age over 30 or age over 50 with some kind of unilateral nipple symptom, whether that's nipple discharge, nipple retraction, or other changes like we talked about, things like Paget's disease, for example, of the nipple. When would you consider an urgent two-week referral? Any skin changes that suggest breast cancer? We've talked about things like polar orange, for example. Or if you're over 30 with an unexplained auxiliary lump, they should be considered for an urgent two-week referral. And then you've got that bottom category of consideration for a non-urgent referral under 30 with an unexplained breast lump with or without pain. So you can see it's similar to the to the one above. It's the age that makes the difference. So if you're over 30 with an unexplained breast lump, then it's a two-week referral. If you're under 30 with an unexplained breast lump, then you consider a non-urgent referral as per the nice suspected cancer guidelines. Let's focus a bit on calcium levels then, and we'll start with hypercalcemia. So calcium levels being too high, greater than 2.6 millimoles per liter, after adjusting for albumin, that's your corrected calcium level. And there are various severity markers, so mild calcium 2.6, so mild hypercalcemia 2.6 to 3, moderate hypercalcemia 3 to 3.4, and important to notice in the question, severe hypercalcemia greater than 3.5. Here we're getting into the realms of admission for secondary care management. Lots of causes for hypercalcemia, hyperparathyroidism and malignancy are the first two that should come to your mind when you see hypercalcemia. Think hyperparathyroidism, in particular primary hyperparathyroidism and malignancy. These two things should come first, but then also things like medications, thiazide diuretics, vitamin D, for example, lithium therapy, and also other conditions like sarcoidosis and TB. But these two are in the majority of cases or the commonest reasons why someone may have a true hypercalcemia picture. Lots of ways that hypercalcemia can present. It could be GI based, so abdominal pain, vomiting, constipation. There might be bone symptoms, so bony pain or bony deformities if it's been there for quite a while. 
Neurological presentations, so drowsiness, coma, and neurological signs, particularly in that more severe category. Renal, so polydipsia, polyuria, and renal stones might be the first presenting feature of hypercalcemia. There's links with depression and also cardiovascular issues as well, so arrhythmias and hypertension, again, particularly in the higher levels um, of calcium. Lots of investigations because of the number of different causes, so full blood count, looking at renal function, GFR, for example, ESR, look, trying to rule out things like malignancy, uh, LFTs, thyroid function tests, PTA, so your parathyroid hormone levels, and vitamin D might all be a baseline. Looking at electrophoresis, again, to rule out things like myeloma, for example, and also things like chest x-rays uh, may be useful as well. In terms of management, like we mentioned, if it's severe levels, then emergency admission is needed for things like acute management with things like IV saline, for example, but also things like loop diuretics, things like bisphosphonates, things like steroids may all be needed depending on cause and severity level of hypercalcemia. Let's look at COPD management then. So guidance has changed quite a lot over the last probably five to 10 years. So what's currently in terms of nice CKS guidance? So three stages, stage one, stage two, stage three, or step one, step two, step three, depending on how you want to look at it. Step one is very simple. It's a short acting bronchodilator, something like a SABA, a short acting beta agonist, something like salbutamol or terbutaline, or a SAMA, a short acting muscarinic antagonist, something like ipratropium. So step one is basically short acting bronchodilators, PRN, as and when needed. Step two, if that's not enough, if symptoms are getting worse, then the next step depends on whether someone has asthma features or not. So remember, in a COPD patient, there may be presence of asthma features or not, and that will determine step two. So if someone doesn't have any asthma features, things like diurnal variation or classic symptoms associated with asthma, then your next step would be a combination of a LABA plus a LAMA, okay? So a long-acting beta agonist, something like salmeterol, plus a long-acting muscarinic antagonist, something like tyotropium. If, however, the question is describing the presence of some asthma features in a COPD patient, step two would be a LABA again, a long-acting beta agonist, plus inhaled corticosteroids. Okay, inhaled corticosteroids. Now in the past, the inhaled corticosteroids bit will be determined by FEV1. And people used to remember FEV1 greater or less than 50% predicted. Now it's the present or absence of asthma features. If step two is not working, then you think about step three. Step three is essentially all three together. LABA, long-acting beta agonist. LAMA, long-acting muscarinic antagonist. And inhaled corticosteroids all together. So three in one. So step one, short-acting bronchodilators. Step two, depends on whether you've got asthma features or not. Step three is three things together, LABA plus LAMA plus ICS. And remember some common examples, SABAs, salbutamol, terbutaline, LAMA, salmeterol, SAMA, ipratropium, and LAMA, tyotropium. Of course, there are other examples as well, but worth getting at least one or two uh, in your mind. So apart from going down those stepwise treatments, there are other things that you may be thinking about um, in a patient if you get a question on COPD. Someone may be at the point where they need regular oral steroids. So again, this is going to be a respiratory physician uh, usually input. Oral theophylline, oral mucolytics, and things like prophylactic antibiotics, particularly someone's getting recurrent infective exacerbations. Now, I've mentioned HbA1c a couple of times already, but there are certain situations where you should not be using HbA1c to try and diagnose diabetes. And so look out for these in a particular question. Children and under 18s, those who are pregnant and those up to two months postpartum, those who have diabetes symptoms for less than two months, so a fairly acute onset of symptoms, if they're acutely unwell at that point, if they're on certain medications that may lead to hyperglycemia, for example, long-term corticosteroids, if someone has acute pancreatic damage, end-stage renal failure, and HIV infection. So try and remember these. If you see them in exam questions, HbA1c should not be used to help diagnose diabetes. Of course, there are many complications associated with diabetes, retinopathy, nephropathy, neuropathy, increased cardiovascular disease risk, things like erectile dysfunction, autonomic neuropathy, depression. But let's talk about these key four that I mentioned in NICE-CKS in terms of how we monitor 
for these potential complications. So it started retinopathy first then. So everybody who's diagnosed with diabetes should be offered an annual retinopathy screen. We covered this in much more detail in the ophthalmology chapter, but there are certain people who are at lower risk of sight loss. They may be offered a two yearly screen, but generally remember annual retinopathy screen for it comes to diabetes. What Let's look at PPIs then. So PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, very common in a variety of GI conditions in terms of management. You need to know these things in terms of basic pharma for these drugs. So key contraindication, well, the only one really, the main one, is that they should not be using a PPI two weeks before an endoscopy because it may mask symptoms of upper GI cancer. So if you get a question about options in terms of doing an endoscopy, make sure and the person not on a PPI or the advice has been given to stop that PPI. There are cautions, of course, you should think about it twice. Um, these are all from NICKS and the BNF. You should think about this twice if they're at risk of osteoporosis and think about whether you're going to use PPIs if someone's got a risk of hypomagnesemia. So make sure these two pop out in a question if you're reading it. Lots of side effects for PPIs, some of them very common, some of them slightly rarer. Headache, dizziness, GI symptoms, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. So you try to treat GI symptoms, but it can cause them as well. Dry mouth, peripheral edema, things like fatigue and sleep disturbance, and things like myalgia and pruritus as well. So lots of side effects potentially for PPIs. Let's look at GORD or G-O-R-D, gastroesophageal reflux disease. This is a chronic condition, so it's usually been there for a long period of time, and you're getting reflux of gastric contents or acid basically back up into the food pipe, back up into the esophagus. Um, so gastroesophageal reflux disease, lots of reflux happening. Um, proven GORD means basically you've had an endoscopy and... You Moving on to vestibular neuronitis then, so inflammation of the vestibular nerve, for example, due to a viral infection. Features can vary, but will include vertigo, like many of these other symptoms that we're talking about. The vertigo can be acute and it can be spontaneous, so completely out of the blue. Uh, nausea, of course, the balance being affected might be described. There's no hearing loss in vestibular neuronitis. This helps to differentiate from labyrinthitis, so no hearing loss and no neurological features. In terms of management, just reassuring generally that it will settle um, over a few weeks in most cases, but there might be need for short-term symptomatic treatment, particularly if it's causing difficulty, um, buccal procloperazine, for example, um, if you're getting severe symptoms. And a few words about labyrinthitis, which does get confused with vestibular neuronitis. This is when you have both inflammation of the labyrinth, but also the vestibular nerve, again, due to a viral infection. Usually, and the key difference between this and vestibular neuronitis is the presence of hearing loss in labyrinthitis. And there may be a need for urgent ENT admission if you think someone has labyrinthitis in a question, particularly of neuron onset. Another exam classic then is Meniere's disease. So that, that it is quite a rare condition, but it comes up in exams like this all the time. So progressive disorder of the inner ear without any clear known cause, but it's thought to do with fluid volume within the labyrinth and changes in this that can lead to the various symptoms. The classic three symptoms to try and remember are DVT, deafness, vertigo, tinnitus. I always used to think of DVT for these three, deafness, vertigo, tinnitus. It can be a relapsing, remitting course, so symptoms come and go. There's no specific diagnostic test for many years disease, but it's all about ruling out other possible causes for the same symptoms. Let's look at Kalasian then. So a Kalasian or a mybomian cyst, the, the two names are synonymous, is a chronic eyelid granuloma. So it's a firm swelling. You can see here, it looks quite firm in the top of the eyelid usually due to sebaceous gland obstruction, usually like we mentioned on the upper eyelid. So chronic eyelid granuloma. Risk factors can include things like chronic blepharitis, seborrheic dermatitis, things like rosacea. Of course, there may not be any risk factors in the question, but look out for these types of things. How do you manage it as per nice AKS? Warm compressions, again, 10 to 15 minutes of quite long warm compressions up to five times a day and then follow it by massage. So it's quite a rigorous set of um, self-help treatment that you do initially for a Kalasian, but you do refer if it persists. For example, if it goes on for about a four-week period, if someone's getting recurrent Kalasian in a question, or if it's causing somebody discomfort at an earlier stage, because ultimately it may need incision and drainage, and it may need things like steroid uh, treatment as well being injected, but that's obviously a case-by-case -case basis. And most will settle themselves, but some do need to be referred for ongoing management. Thank <laughs> you.